Hi everyone. My name is Nicole Keane. I'm the creative programmer here. Thanks so much for joining us today. And thank you to our members, donors, partners who all make our program possible. I hope many of you have been able to visit v &A Dundee to see Night Fever designing Club Culture 1960 to now. From graphics to architecture, light into music, nightclubs are an example of total design and clubbing is a major thread of contemporary life from the personal to the political. Nightclubs are important spaces for people to seek pleasure, forget themselves and find acceptance among like-minded communities. All of this and more are explored in the exhibition. And today we are going to be joined by curator Kirsty Hazard and cultural historian Mary Mackenzie to explore the particularly rich and eclectic period in Scottish clubbing history between 1987 and 1997, which they researched in depth to develop additional content for the Night Fever exhibition at Dundee. Before I invite them on to join us, I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of the Zoom functions we're going to use today. Mary and Kirsty's presentation and conversation is going to be followed by an audience Q&A, so we really encourage you to ask questions throughout using the Q&A function so that we can address all of those at the end. If you would like to use the closed caption function, please do just enable that on your bottom bar. Details on how to use the Q&A and the closed caption functions have been posted in the chat. And finally, if you are going to talk about this event online, which we definitely encourage, please do tag us at using at VA Dundee on social media and do use the speaker's social media links, which have been posted in the chat as well. That is it from me. So all that is left to do is to invite both of our speakers to join us. Kirsty and Mary, please do come on. Hi, Hello. Mary. Hi, Kirsty. Hi, Nicole. So uh, I guess we'll get started. So yeah, I'm uh, joined by uh, Mary McKenzie here today. And over the past year, um, mainly during lockdown, actually, yeah, we worked together to curate the uh, extra section on Scottish club culture that you see in Gallery 2 um, when you come to the Night Fever exhibition at V&A Dundee that I hope uh, many of you have been, been able to see. But if not, um, we have a lot of images today. So hopefully you'll get a, a good sense um, of what it's like to to see the archive and, and to come um, to the exhibition. Um, and I guess what really sort of underpinned um, both of our, our roles and what we wanted to do um, in this extra section was really look at the cultural importance of nightclubs and night uh, light, nightlife and um, celebrate that, that profound importance. Um, so really looking at the creative outputs that are associated with nightlife and the impact that has on the clothes that we wear, the music that we listen to, uh, the design of our public and our private spaces, um, how they can act as hotbeds for and catalysts of social, cultural and uh, political change. And on a more social and individual level, and I think you really see this as you delve more into the stories that you see in, in the objects that um, Mary and I chose for this section. It's yeah, where we meet our partners, it's where we meet our friends, um, experiment with and discover our tastes and behaviours in an environment that is constantly evolving. Um, and I guess, I mean, I suppose curating this section during lockdown, it's really shown the the importance of this, this social aspect that's one of the things that we've been, we've been missing the most. Um, so I'm just going to jump into my first question for Mary and ask you what your role um, on the exhibition uh, actually was, although I realise I've touched on it a little bit in my introduction. Hello, Kirsty. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so, yes, Night Fever, it's important to point out it's a touring show and it was originally curated by Catherine Rossi, Jochen Eisenbrand and Katerina Serialis. It was originally ex exhibit exhibited at the Vitra Museum in Germany and then went on tour around Europe. And when it was coming to Dundee, I was brought in as a consultant curator to think about with Kirsty and curate a section that looked at Scottish nightlife. I don't remember being given a particularly strict remit. No, not at all. We really no. just pick up on some things that were particular to Scotland. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it came around... Um, us having a coffee in the cafe at V&A Dundee and sort of saying, yeah, we've got this exhibition on night fever that's coming up. Would you be interested in working on it? I think the brief was actually, yeah, really, really vague. And then obviously I think it, yeah, it developed more over, um, yeah, over conversations down the line. But I think at the start, yeah, it was very, 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 um, very open, I would say, yeah. Yeah, and then we first met um, 
through my work. I think I taught you, Kirsty, at Glasgow yeah. University, yeah. And through various conferences, and my research more generally looks at the history of dressing up and going out. So that was one of the reasons I was brought in. Yeah, definitely. It was that um, completely brilliant talk that you gave at a DATS conference in Brighton, I think in 2017, on perfume and going out that has just always stuck in my mind. And when we were sort of internally talking about bringing on a consultant curator um, for this section, yeah, you were 100% the first person that I thought of um, to bring on. Yeah. I'm delighted. Thank <laughs> you. Um, yeah, and it wasn't just my professional background. So I suppose my own personal background, mm -hmm. like many people, I went out a lot. I loved going out. So from, say, between the ages of 17 and 23, 24, I think I was out almost every single night. Um, but also I worked in nightclubs. So I worked handing out flyers for the tunnel, the volcano. I got paid to dance on top of podiums. And for a short time, I worked as a dancer in the BCN in Magaluf alongside wow. Jenny Halliwell. <laughs> AKA ginger spice. <laughs> nice. Definitely in that sense. That, that is a good story. Yeah. She was just Jerry from Watford. I mean, I was only Jerry from Watford, but yeah, it was Jerry Halliwell. And then professionally, all of my research really is a methodical look at the passions of my youth. Yep. So I look at perfume, fashion, music, um, the relationship between fashion, music, and the history of dressing up and going out. So really, I guess all of those things really blended together to and, and uh, lent to your work um, on the exhibition, really. It feels like, yeah, yeah the, the perfect show really to work on. For me, yeah. For you, it. yeah, for sure. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, actually, so we can start to look at some um, images um, of the exhibition. Let me just bring that up just now. I think what the from our side, um, one of the nicest things was being able to, as you mentioned, to add to the content. Um, the exhibition itself, I think the furthest north that it looks at is um, is a hacienda in Manchester. So it was, yeah, for us it was so important being able to really recognise the importance of of Scottish club culture. Um, I'm just going to flip forward a slide so that. For hopefully, yeah, like I said, a lot of you have been to the exhibition, but for those of you who haven't, um, this is this is the room that um, Mary and I are talking about, and predominantly the right side um, of the room. So everything that you see on the wall, the clothing, the, um, the photography, um, up towards where the screen is, and then the two cases that are towards the back of the room, plus this little room in here that we're we'll going to talk about, which is uh, the lidar scan. So I guess, um, yeah, from, from my side, I suppose one of the important questions to ask is what your curatorial approach was um, on developing this section with us. Okay, so straight away there was a problem. <laughs> Scottish people love going out, so there's no <laughs> shortage of beloved nightclubs, dance halls, venues. So to narrow it down, I chose a period from 87 to 97. <laughs> Um, and this was a period in which Scotland, as well as many other countries, went through radical changes in nightlife. The changes in the music that was being listened to, the technology that was used to create that music, share it and listen to it. There was also the political backdrop of late Thatcherism, poll tax riots, the Criminal Justice Act, and the sort of rise and decline of rave culture within that. Um, but it's important to note, though, that from a curatorial point of view, we all have dreams about what we would put in an exhibition. Yeah. There's also a very practical element to it, like what's available. Yeah. Nightclubs, things don't tend to survive, you know, by their yeah. very nature, they get carried to after parties, they get lost, people wear their clothes to death or they get covered in absolute rubbish from rolling about, I don't know, on the floors or whatever. Um, so what survives really dictates what's in the exhibition as well. None of the objects chosen came from existing museum archives they're often personal collections so really what you see in the exhibition is what has survived as well as it being a curia curatorial intervention um yeah that's and that very much reflects the the vitra side of the show as well i think um the vitra show has got maybe like 400 objects in it and i think only and I, almost the same amount of lenders and I think only three um, museum collections are represented in the main exhibition so I guess it's a story that is almost universal or international in terms of of nightclubs what survives yeah it doesn't really tend to go into museum collections it's what people choose to keep and the yeah. reasons that, that they choose to keep them yeah 
And really, you shouldn't be thinking about archives when you're out. At no, night. sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, it should be about having a good time. So exactly. But I'm hoping maybe this will. I don't know. I guess it's a kind of interesting chat about do do objects from nightclubs should they be included in museums? I mean, I suppose that's kind of one of the arc one of the arguments, isn't it? Do they almost kind of like like stagnate at the point that they they enter into a museum collection or are put on a display in a museum? I know that that's some of the yeah, some of the sort of conversation um that we've had around displaying these objects. I mean that's the same with any discussion around any object in a museum. Yeah. It becomes sort of ossified. Yeah. Um, and you know, it can rob it of the very life that gave it its vitality yep. in the first place. But yes, I would say as a curator and someone yep. who works in museums, yes, these things should be stored in archives. I agree. <laughs> and obviously for someone who works with dress as well, because I guess that argument is so strong for, for fashion and for dress yep. collections um, yep. to if something's not been worn, does it lose some of that meaning? Absolutely. Um, so what what do you think um, excited you most about what you found when you were doing the research um, around this archive? Okay, so just generally, I love seeing a culture or a movement or a style transposed from its origins to somewhere completely different and odd that you wouldn't ordinarily think of it. So to see techno thrive in Stranraer or <laughs> to me is really exciting. Um, now that's not something that's unique to Scotland. These cultures are transposed all over the world. Um, but what I do think, and this is not a technical term, but for want of a better phrase, I would say Scottish people are really up for it. Mm -hmm. And there was a real excitement and vigor to the objects that I found and the stories of parting that were told by them. Um, people seem to have a really great time and I hope this came across in the research. So that generally is an overview of what I found exciting. Definitely. And I think um, from my point of view as well, it was so great to see the links that you could make between what was already in the existing show um, with what was emerging in Scotland at that time too. So yeah, as you've mentioned already, looking at techno and looking at the sort of influences that were coming out of Detroit and how that was uh, manifest in Scotland as well. Um, yeah, that was really wonderful to see from from my point of view. Yeah, yeah, because these things, you know, they retain their original elixir vitae, and then they take on new forms, and that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, and I guess they're definitely not seen in you know like isolation. Scotland isn't seen in isolation. It's got you know so many amazing links to yeah, it's all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Moving on to probably quite a, a big question, I know that's one that um, we've come up across, come across quite a lot through, definitely through the development of this section, but um, definitely since it's been open to the public, um, what about the clubs that were, that were left out or what clubs, um, yeah, what clubs would you have wanted to include it, to have included as well? Oh my goodness. <laughs> know, know. Massive question. This was the hardest thing, like I say, you it know. Was so many amazing clubs and yep. people have visited and they're going to visit and say where's my club and I can understand yep. that it's such a an important part of people's histories you could have five aircraft hangers and you still wouldn't be able to include okay. it all yep. you know there are clubs like slam the entire career of Colin Barr could have its own exhibition yep. you have the Metro and Saltcoats, Far Island in Edinburgh, Arbroath, Aberdeen, Inverness everywhere has an amazing club so it just couldn't be included. Also, from a practical point of view, going back to what I said about the objects that are available, you know, some clubs only, the only thing that remains of them are flyers and photographs, and that just wouldn't have made for the right kind of exhibition yep. in a design museum. They're all important, yep. but um, there are, there's a lot of work left to be done. This is just the beginning. So if you're a researcher or a journalist or anyone who's interested, you know, there are loads of different ways you can take this exhibition as a stepping up off point. It's not a completest, completest account of Scottish clubbing history. And yeah, it shouldn't sure. be that way. It's a snapshot. Yeah. Tiny snapshot. But from a practical point of view, Kirsty, there are things people can do to contribute to an archive that is going to be ongoing after this, isn't there? Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, I guess really to touch upon two of the things that you're talking about there. So within the exhibition itself, in fact, you can see it in the photograph at the very back, there's three maps. Um, so there's a, a map of the whole of Scotland and then there's sort of zoned in maps of um, 
the four main cities, so Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Dundee and Glasgow. Um, and from an exhibition design point of view, I thought it was really important for we for people to have this sort of output and being able to yeah to recognize clubs that you know for whatever reason we weren't able to include in this section but were obviously important and as yeah as you're saying people have got such strong and emotional connections to these clubs and it's amazing to see these maps being populated every single day a lot of the time with clubs that are very very well known and sometimes with ones that you haven't heard of and the sort of timelines and the, the kind of um specific points in time that people went to them. But yeah, um, aside from that, yes, yeah, so and my colleagues in the um, audiences and media team, they're working on uh, working on a project called um, Everybody in the Club. And um, that will be, a, yeah, I guess a sort of call out for people's memories and um, material and so on. So yeah, once we've got more information um, on that and how you can contribute to that, that will be on um, our social media channels as well. So yeah, we were uh, as a museum as well, we were obviously fully, fully aware that, um, yeah, we couldn't capture everyone's experience and every club in Scotland. And the same is true for the the exhibition, the, the Vitra exhibition as well. I think they featured 20 clubs um, and they were also completely open to the fact that there would have been areas, clubs, yeah, um, missed out. So, yeah, the neither of the sections are, are meant to be comprehensive. I guess they're almost like a sort of snapshot of... As, as you're saying, a period in time and also of, um, yeah, the clubs that we that we chose to feature, yeah. I mean, just on that point, you know, if these are things you're interested in, there are loads of great um, groups on Facebook, um, Instagram, where you, the actors repositories and spaces where people can share their memories as well. So it's worth hunting those out. Definitely, yeah. And I think, I suppose, one of the nicest things that's came out of the exhibition is, yeah, the stories that, that people are sharing um, about these experiences that they had as well so yeah it is really nice that the exhibition will continue to have a life um after it finishes in january you know that we've yeah mm -hmm. sort of created a repository for people to yeah to discuss uh, a bit more yeah but yeah and um, moving on to the clubs that you did choose to highlight um what were they okay so <laughs> three clubs sub club and a couple of the nights held there or three of the nights held their subculture atlantis and optimo Mm -hmm. um, Club 69 in Paisley and Fever and the DJ Jackie Morrison or As Acid Jacks in Aberdeen. And also we chose a selection of clothing worn by clubbers at, in that period. So I'm going to move on to slide. It's actually a really good moment to move on to slide um, about uh, sub club. Um, so I guess the other big question around this is why, why sub club and what were some of the favourite your favourite objects that you found when you were researching this? Okay so the sub club is a really obvious choice. Everyone's heard of it um, but it would have been perverse to leave it out almost. Yep. You know this is not the moment to leave I out the sub club. Um, so it was very important. It's been important to a lot of people and it's been really important to nightlife in Scotland. Um, what I wanted to do though was bring, a, bring objects into the forefront that hadn't been seen before to sort of bring new understandings and ways of looking at the sub club so things that are not necessarily seen before so we're starting here with the diaries the function mm -hmm. diaries um, so they're just diaries out of WH Smith or John Menzies you know they're fairly modest and we have them from 88 through to 91 I love the tip X on the cover as well. <laughs> so, book. so sub club function book wild. But what's inside it, um, it gives you an insight into loads of things from a historical point of view about running nightclubs. So the first thing is the logistics of running a nightclub, when the deep cleans take place, when the repairs take place, how they staff, how people put in for their holidays. It also shows us how they operate financially. So the 21st birthday parties that we have to have or the work staff do's best um, one so they would make tickets people would pay and then the sub club would provide tickets for them and so it was like the risk assessors christmas night out it was called risky business night <laughs> it's lovely wee things like that and then you see things like colin Barr had a night on at the brigade so they knew they wouldn't need many staff that night because anything colin Barr put on was going to be really busy you can see the first night that soul to soul play in scotland and this is one of my favorite pages so it's jerry butler gerard butler the hollywood actor <laughs> he was a student at glasgow university studied law and he comes down and you see over a few years that he comes down and books the christmas party 
and what they called it, the GU Law Society Diploma <laughs> Something Club, Wigs and Gowns. Wigs <laughs> So yeah, just all those lovely bits of social and cultural history that you can see inside them as well. Um, yeah, so they're just total gems, I guess, and them. Yeah. yeah, just as you say, really, really assuming objects. But yeah, what they have inside is just yeah, so yeah, incredible. Yeah, they tell other stories about the nightclub. And um, also, it was really important for me to foreground the affection within which the clubs were held. Definitely. So the next object we're going to look at, I think we have here. Okay, so it's a star. Mm -hmm. um, it's a name a star certificate and it's gifted to subculture which was the lo longest running night at the sub club on the occasion of its birthday um, it's given by a uh, attendee called Marie Thompson who I believe made some of the designed some of the early flyers for the sub club and she said happy birthday subculture and thank you to the special people who make it special um, it's a place that will always be about the music to celebrate, I have named a star subculture so that after we are long gone to the big DJ box in the sky, subculture will always shine brightly in the night sky. Happy birthday with much love, Marie. <laughs> really beautiful. It just really, it's really it. touching and poignant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. These things, you know, matter. You know, nightclubs yeah. are seen as, and we can see that by the way the government's treated them during lockdown, they're seen as a sort of add-on or an extra, something ephemeral, but they're vital parts of people's lives. And the next thing we're going to look at really shows that. This is, yeah. thing, my this is one, one of, my of yeah, things. for sure. Yeah, I'm just going to show a little uh, little video clip here. Um, but I'll just explain what it is first. Oh yeah, of course. It's, yeah. it's a film taken from the under 18s night in 1997. And it just interviews the people who are there what they're up to, the music they're listening to, and how they feel about going out for the night. So here's a new clip. I'm just going to make sure that I'm sharing my sound. Um, so I'm just going to come out of the presentation for a little second and, uh, yeah, stop sharing because I'm not sure whether I actually... Oh, no, I did. It's good to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm just going to play this. Uh... What up, here? I'm take my phone say hi. I'm going to get a it's our last night. This is a speaking mode, and uh, definitely a touch music from the condition of us. But we just don't care, all we're interested in is dancing yeah, and socialising and dance. Things. Oh, I love that so much. Um, so the under 18s nights were massive, you know, in the 90s and 2000s. Did you ever go to them, Kirsty? I'm not from Glasgow, but... Did uh, I didn't, them? but I think the, the, the funniest thing about it is that, like, all the... The fashion and the haircuts in particular and that Burberry shirt was still uh, pretty fashionable by the time that I started going to, to unders nights, um, even though that was a little bit later. So it's nice to see that some uh, some fashion is timeless, um, yeah, particularly in Glasgow. <laughs> even though it's been with that blue background and the lighting, it really reminds me of a magazine from the late 90s called Sky Magazine. Yeah. So visually, it's reminiscent of lots of other things that are going on at that time. And you can practically smell the hormones, you know, all the talk about <laughs> yeah is how many people we got off with that night, which is wonderful. I love but also it. quite poignant because they're not going out just now and they're not getting that right of passage. But yeah, hopefully Definitely. it won't be too long before um, they're able to go out. Yeah, I mean, as of, I mean, yeah, I guess that was the kind of important point to highlight that obviously, yeah, we, you know, we curated this section during, yeah, peak lockdown when we weren't really sure when nightclubs were going to reopen. But yeah, they have as of Monday night, I think. Yeah, I think people were in there, bang on midnight, Monday yep. night. <laughs> I wasn't there. It was reported to Scotland. Me neither. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's so. nice that, uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of what we're talking about today doesn't feel like it's some sort of thing that's been consigned to the past. It, you know, it's something that's, yeah, happening yeah. at the moment. It'll be live. Yeah, well, just... on that note, I did want something contemporary 
in the yep. exhibition. You did. So a contemporary representation of a club, um, something that. <laughs> I wanted to commission new work that looked at clubbing history, but also where we are now in terms of capturing the lockdown and how we feel about nightclubs at the moment. So what we're about to see, there were two pieces commissioned for this. The first is a LIDAR scan. So a LIDAR is a 3D scan that's more ordinarily used in archaeology, geology, atmospheric physics and so on. And I spoke with Damien Smith from ISO Design, the digital design company, and um, he incidentally had been designing flyers for the subclub and posters since about 1990. Um, we discussed a few options and Damien came up with this idea to do a 3D scan of the subclub and it has a really ghostly appearance, which really resonates right now. The other commission was the soundtrack that goes with it. Um, it was a commission that Johnny Wilkes from Optimo Spacio undertook. And the brief was to distill a night at the sub club into 30 minutes, which is no small feat, but really captured it. So he's recorded the sound of Jamaica Street, the sound of Treasure Island. You can hear the bingo colors and the arcade machines going upstairs. That, that incredible sound when you get into the sub -club, club of that booming and you going down the stairs and then you open the door and you're in the club. So we have a one minute clip here that just shows, yeah, these two commissions. Yeah, I guess a little taste of it, yeah. Let me just play that. It gave me goosebumps when I first saw it, and I love everything about it. There's a sort of shot that goes up to Jamaica Street. You can see it through the roof of the sub club. You get the 3D scan of the um, turntables. And this is um, what Mike, who owns the sub club, had to say about it. He said, capturing the club in this unique way at this odd moment in the subway's history is very poignant. It shows the space in a kind of ossified state, which truly reflects how the club is right now with nightlife on hold. Most of the images anyone ever sees of the club show crowds of people in a buzzy, lively environment. And people have always remarked that there's a palpable energy in the space itself, almost as if the music and excitement lives in the bones of the place, as if the room itself is waiting for the party to start again. And it's not to say that this should be viewed as a memorial piece, it's very current, but um, it gives us a chance to reflect and capture where we are at the moment in terms of clubbing. Pretty beautiful quote. I think the thing that I love about it is it shows Subclub as this like underground world as well, you know, completely separate from, but I guess connected to as well the street that it's on. Yeah. Um, and I think when you see in the exhibition, you we go into that room with the music and the visuals that yeah that we've just shown. It's just yeah, a really really incredible experience. It's such a great part of part of the room in general. Yeah, and it has a great sound system, and you can go and listen to great music and. You know, with an incredible sound system that was brought in by Johnny. Yeah. Um, so yeah, almost like a mini nightclub yeah. in itself, really. I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So moving on to the next club. Sorry, I think we might have a little bit of music. Um. Yeah. What's the What's the next club that we're Yeah, that we're going to move on to. The next club is Fever in Aberdeen. Um, Fever started in 1989. It was run by Jim Rennie and Mike Greaves. Um, and it was the first acid house night in Scotland and it was hugely um, successful, hugely popular and these contracts here, we weren't able to include them in the exhibition, there wasn't room, but I think contracts generally that go between clubs and 
the people who play there always tell their own story. So on the left, we have, um, I'll go into more detail on Fever and Jackie in a bit, but on the left, we have Adamski, his tour date. So, so it shows you all the clubs that were playing that kind of music at the time and where an artist of that nature would go on tour. The one in the middle is um, Double Trouble and the Rebel MC. And the story goes that the night that they played in Fever, Mike picked them up from Glasgow Airport. They were going to Aberdeen. The top 40 was playing and they found out they were number three in the chart. And so absolute mayhem ensued and a brilliant night followed and they ended up playing football in the streets of um, Aberdeen. After <sighs> and on the right is Jocelyn Brown, the incredible artist. And Mike said she didn't even need a PA. Her voice just filled the room when she played a fever, which is quite remarkable. It really is, yeah. So anyway, the resident DJ throughout all of this was Jackie Morrison. So if we come on to the next slide, that's Jackie there at the bottom, photographed with Harry, very famous Scottish DJ, I think one of the longest standing DJs at the sub club. And on the right is Graham Park from the Hacienda. And she was known as Acid Jacks. She first got into DJing because everyone went back to her house, the house she shared with her partner, Tracy, and everyone loved her records. They couldn't believe all the amazing records she had. She had a real talent. So they got her into DJ, and then that's how her career was born. Um, she was the first breakthrough female club DJ in Scotland, and her reputation went before her. So as I've said, this is Graham Park from the Hacienda. And when he wasn't there, he got her to sit in for him. And she totally smashed it. And, you know, he invited her back. Also, she played on Paul Confield's Wizard of Oz tour. And who was it? Roger Sanchez invited her to New York for the Strictly Rhythm, to work for Strictly Rhythm. But, and this is an important part of Jackie's story and also about, you know, people's lives generally. They don't always go to plan. And Jackie, sorry, I get rid of this cat. No, <laughs> so, um, guest so, appearance. <laughs> help herself. Um, so Jackie suffered from extreme performance anxiety, and um, this often led her struggling to actually get into the DJ booth. Mm -hmm. And then later, this coupled with uh, hearing impairment brought about from working in nightclubs meant that she retired around about two thousand and one. But she's still thought of very highly. Um, so she. If we go on to the next slide, actually, this is just one example of how highly she is thought of. This is a book by Pat Henderson. It's published in 2009 called Decades, and it's the story of a friendship set against the background of, you know, brutal gang violence and the love and peace of um, the rave scene in Scotland. And he dedicates in the page here to Jackie. He said, to the DJ who changed everything for a young me, thanks for that, Jackie. Pat, really beautiful. Yes. Um, I think Mike has some videos and tapes of Jackie's night, so yeah. Yeah, and I think the loveliest thing was obviously, yeah, she came to the the opening of the exhibition and just being able to show that section and kind of show how important she was and, you know, in the context of clubbing in Scotland and, yeah, nationally was just, yeah, a really, really lovely thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's a total joy yeah. to meet as well. Yeah, really amazing person. Um, so... Moving on. Moving on, yes. Yeah, so the, the final club that you looked at. So just yeah, jumping ahead to, to the image. It's a bit of a well, preview. it's Club 69 yep. in Paisley, one of my favourite clubs of all time. It was founded in 1993 by the owners of Rubber Dub Records. Now, Rubber Dub is one of the best electronic music and equipment shops in the world. Um, and the club was founded in December 93 and it took place in the basement of the Koinur restaurant in Paisley. Fairly small capacity. Um, but it developed a reputation that went far beyond its modest size. So Music Magazine named it um, Best Techno Club in the UK. Underground Resistance played there regularly, and the DJ Jack Master said this about it. A subject I've discussed with loads of DJs before is if they could be teleported back in time to any era in music, where and when would they go? Most people say the music box, the loft, the warehouse, or the paradise garage, or hacienda, or whatever. I'd honestly say, take me to Club 69 in the 90s. Just, and I think, yeah, one of the, the key objects in this section is the, the members book. Yeah, I mean, this is taken on mythical proportions. Again, it's just, uh, sorry, that bloody cat. Um, no, so, um, one second, I just need to- Yeah, no problem. Uh, 
where she's got a toy that she'll just chuck around the room. <laughs> yeah, just wants to be part of the talk as well, yeah, I think. Exactly. Anyway, so this member's book, so it was Members Club and people put on a passport size photo yep. and their names and addresses were in it. So it tells us about the club, but it also tells us what people were wearing at that time, how far people travelled. There's, you know, a warmth to it as well. You know, people were putting fake names in and whatnot. So, yeah, it's just a really beautiful object, even though it is just a piece of stationery. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, it kind of almost transcends that, doesn't it? The thing that, yeah. yeah, I think when we were trying to choose what page is displayed in the exhibition, which you can see in uh, the image on on the top right, it was just so difficult to choose because there were so many complete gems of, yeah, like stories and photographs that you could, yeah, you could unpick from it. Such yeah, amazing hairstyles and amazing yeah. hairstyles <laughs> yeah. to use for the members but really funny as well and then um, how people have been crossed out for bad behavior as well i enjoyed that too yeah absolutely. <laughs> yes exactly barred i'm barred <laughs> so for me the joy of club 69 really is in the flyers and newsletters there's a real warmth to them they're really funny they're all done by martin mckay who's one of the um, owners of Rub a Dub and who ran Club 69. Here are two examples. One of the left is a word search. <laughs> and it's supposed to be a word search of DJ names. I can't find any. All I can find <laughs> are rude words. So, yeah, I'll, you can come in and have a look. Yeah, stuff, but you can maybe see. some of our viewers here today can... Um can yeah, pick yeah. some <laughs> can pick some out. And it's obviously an exhibition as well for anyone who wants a closer look. And... My favourite flyers, the Saddam Hussein one. West Bam, no. East Bam, no. Middle East Bam, yippee. Get down to 69, it's the bomb. And all the newsletters, you know, there's a lot of reading in them, but it's worth taking your time off them because they're wonderful, really funny. Well. And we were, luckily, we had quite a lot of um, of table space for Club 69, so we were able to include a good number of those flyers yeah. um, in the exhibition. And yeah, as you say, they do tell this, yeah, amazing, amazing story of it, um, yeah, through them. Really, really fantastic. Um, I think next, though, I mean, I used to go to Club 69, and this is a photo of me with my friends. That's me with the white top, <sighs> black shirt, short hair and white shoes, um, standing outside Club 69. Well. Now, this photo has prompted lots of debate between me and my friends. <laughs> it really highlights the difficulty of researching nightclubs and depending on people's memories. So my friend Claire, she's the one hitching up her skirt there. <laughs> This, um, she says it's the opening night of Club 69, which was in the middle of winter in 93. I say it's the summer of 94. It would, this would have had to have been taken at like two in the afternoon for the sunlight to be there, but not that's yep. that sunny. Um, my friend Maddie, who's got in the photo on the right, she's got the black velvet jacket on. She said she'd never been to Club 69. <laughs> she definitely, she definitely was. And Claire also said that dress was hers, but I thought it was mine from French Connection because there's a photo of me wearing it a Pink Floyd concert in the summer of 19. <sighs> anyway, I'm a fashion historian and I know those Patrick Cox wannabe loafers came out in early 94. So I'm sticking with the summer of 94. But anyway, they say okay. you remember it, you weren't really there. But yeah, that's part of the problem with researching something like this. It definitely is. And I suppose, yeah, the yeah, your your uh, discussion about the fashion and how that's so important for pinpointing the point that these photographs are taken, which is definitely a, a skill for all fashion historians, um, is yeah. a good point to go on to the next section that yes. we worked on, which um, as obviously both being, uh, yeah, involved in, in fashion and working as, yeah, curators and, mm -hmm. and fashion historians was, yeah, I guess really important for both of us to represent this um, in the show. Yeah, clothing's a huge part of what made clubbers so distinctive in this period. Um, you had the rise of designer boutiques alongside the second-hand market, and boutiques were important cultural centres that were a sort of precursor to going out that night. They had great music playing, flyers on the counter, a real party atmosphere. So you'd have the boutique, the bar, and then the nightclub. Um, I put out a call on Facebook and Instagram asking for people to send me their photos and any clothing they still had left from that period. I hardly got any photos though. You know, people didn't take cameras out then, but this one I think is particularly good. It's Willie Rosedale and his friend Graham taken at Shampers Nightclub in Aberdeen on New Year's Eve in 1988. They're both wearing Shum t-shirts, Shum being the club that is widely said to have popularized Acid House in this mm -hmm. country. And they're both wearing Westwood jackets because Willie Rosedale, was a hairdresser. He owned a hairdresser's Rosedale's and they sold Westwood pieces 
in the shop. And then aside, it's generally fashion-wise in cities, hairdressers were so important. They really led the way stylistically, not just in the way that they were styling other people, but in the way that they looked and the things mm -hmm. that they wore. Also, hairdressers' day off was a Monday, so Sunday night was always a great night to go. <laughs> anyway, I didn't get many photos. Instead, what I got were um, cloth items of clothing. Um, it's a massive area. Oh, yeah. So, oh, sorry. sorry to, to no, 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 no. But it tended to be from certain boutiques. I narrowed it down again um, because most of the clothes came from very particular boutiques. So we have H&Nissan in Glasgow, Dr. Jives, again, on candle rigs in Glasgow. Um, the next slide is of Virginia Galleries. There was a shop there called Viva Love. And on the right was the Nigel Coates designed Catherine Hamnet shop in Princess Square, which are really important for clubbers. They used to sort of congregate in the steps there in front of Catherine Hamnet because they didn't have mobile phones there. It was somewhere to the top. And so from this, because again, I suppose limited with uh, <laughs> limited with space, um, what did you, yeah, what did you decide to include um, for this section? Okay, so um, the first thing I'm going to show you. Uh, oh, and yeah, it would be oh, good right, to show okay. you an kind of overview of what we actually outfits. ended up including. Yeah. Basically six outfits. So again, you know, it's really hard to narrow it down. So most of these outfits come from boutiques in Glasgow. One of them is from Dundee, um, but I'll come on to that in a second. So the first one we'll look at is the white cardigan owned by Nick Peacock, one of the original DJs at the sub club. And it was by Duffer of St. George. Duffer of St. George was sold in each Nissan and it was hugely important at this time. They started out in Camden Market. They had a shop in Darbley Street. They brought loads of things to the UK for the first time, like shorts, boots, um, red wing boots, shorts, jackets, red wing boots, Adidas Superstar. And these cardies were called the Yardy Cardi. It was a mix of dance hall, Italian casual and um, yeah, Italian and casual style. And Nick said, he wore this in the sub, sub club is roasting. It's really yeah. hot. And the thought of wearing a woolly cardigan there, <laughs> I couldn't have done it. But anyway, Nick suffered for fashion and this is what he had to say. He said, I bought this from each Nissan and wore it to the sub club with white Levi's, Saxon's Oxblood loafers and our gel socks. I did sweat for fashion's sake in the sub. <laughs> and I think they're really- still in great condition. It really is. Yeah, it was, yeah, I guess pleasantly surprised actually when we were preparing this for display. I think there's maybe like a couple of like tiny pen marks on it, but other than that, it's yeah. impeccable, um, which as you see, I consider in its history is quite yeah. a surprise. Yeah. It's better than any outfit I would have worn. Yeah, my clothes <laughs> are absolutely trashed. Um, so the next outfit we're looking at is by Joe Casey Hayford. Joe Casey Hayford, he sadly died in 2019. He was a British Ghanaian designer and he took a mix of, sort of traditional tailoring with streetwear. His clothing was exquisite. I mm -hmm. absolutely love this outfit. It was owned by Stephen Flannery, who was the owner of each Nissan. And um, my friend Becca Lipscomb modeled these trousers. I think when she was a model at the day, well, she was modeling in the Daily Record or the Scottish Sun. I can't remember which it was. And these are in brilliant condition. They're incredible. So the trousers are from 1991, and the shirt is from the 1989 Loverboy collection. The next one outfit is we're just going to look at two more outfits. This is a destroy leather jacket from John Richmond. Now, I remember when I first moved to Glasgow, seeing people wearing destroy and just thinking, what the hell am I looking at? It was, you know. T-shirts that said destroy down the side, jackets, leather jackets, trousers. That seemed like an evolution of a bondage trouser. And I remember seeing the price and just being totally blown away. Now, it didn't take me long to get au fait with the prices in Glasgow. You know, within a year, I was, you know, quite comfortable spending a lot of money in clothes. But this was owned by Amanda Glasgow, who was the manageress of each Nissan. Um, she bought this in 1990, and it's the Warrior Graffiti Jacket, an iconic um, piece by John Richmond. She said, um, I wore that jacket practically every weekend till it was out of fashion. It had a cock ring hanging from each shoulder, but I've lost those. It, I like that it says warrior in the back because you had to have the stamina of a warrior to survive the Glasgow clubs, which were open until 5am in 1990. I think the, I suppose one of the nicest things about um, going to the exhibition is a lot of the quotes that you're 
that you've been speaking about um during yeah during our q a they're actually there so you're seeing the objects and you're seeing this like meaning that these these objects had to the people that wore them which is yeah always always particularly nice i suppose one of the things that comes out of this is why these and i guess you've touched on it already is so why these objects these uh, pieces of clothing survive compared to as you mentioned other pieces of clothing that were just you know like yeah worn to death and then just thrown out or or given away mm -hmm. yeah i mean this happens in all fashion collections the clothing that tends to get saved is ceremonial it costs a lot yep. it's stuff that wedding dresses or yep. <laughs> yeah. uniforms, designer clothing that people really treasure because they've spent a lot of money on it there was a style of jean called Mozart jeans that were printed, digital printed, and I really wanted to get a pair, but everyone that I spoke to that had them, the Mozart jeans had fallen apart. Uh, yeah. So um, same with like t-shirts from Dr. Jives. People had worn them, they'd fallen apart. Yeah. You know, as it should be, but these yeah, clothes, yeah, right, they and it's why we were able to include them in the show. And then the final one is this. And yeah, I don't know if you want to speak a bit about it, being from Dundee. Yeah, so I guess um I suppose yeah as as you're saying a lot of the a lot of the clubs that featured in this section definitely had a more um Glasgow and West of Scotland uh, connection apart from fever obviously but yeah we did want to include something that nodded um to Dundee um and this yeah incredible cat suit um that was worn by Donna Jameson and then has a um yeah particularly great quote associated with it as well. So yeah so it's by yeah Red or Dead dating from uh, 1990, which is when she bought it at the store in London. I think what is particularly great about this, and you know, we've spoke about this before, is the digital print technology that was used on this, which was really quite cutting edge um, at the time. That's how you're able to get this amazing pattern of a biscuit tin, essentially, mm -hmm. that um, <laughs> is uh, spread across the jumpsuit. And again, the the quote that goes with it that I'm just going to read out is really just sums up what it meant for her to wear it. Um, so, yeah, so Donna said that she bought the cat suit from Red or Dead in uh, London in 1990. At the time, she was an art student, so most of her clothes are vintage from charity shops. I could afford this as it was in the sales. It was bright and vibrant and spoke to my kitsch cartoon dress sense at that time. Wore the cat suit at Fat Sam's uh, in Dundee, uh, later at Sub Club. Arches, etc., in Glasgow. It was great for dancing, and dancing was my number one priority. I would dance for hours on end, usually two or three times a week. I worked in the bar next door to Fat Sam's, and I was able to get in for free to the club whenever I liked. The cat suit used to get a lot of attention and positive comments. I think everyone loved it. I'm not surprised. It's great. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it was just really wonderful to see these clothes again and having that recognition. Like, oh my god, I remember that. I remember you wearing that. So yeah, that's a really beautiful. Thing. I think that might be yeah I think that's actually the the end um of our sort of more formal um q and and presentation and I guess maybe a good point to open out to questions from the audience um if anyone has them Hi, yeah, we do have um, a couple. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to say we're having such lovely chats in the uh, in the conversation and lots of people are commenting and talking about their outfits and their kind of club memories and that actually kind of links really well to the question, um, which is if there if you feel there is ever a gap between what is considered personal memory and what is considered social history. Yeah. Um, social history takes into account personal memory, but it also looks at the sociological aspects of the structures that are in place that surround those personal experiences. So it's about making those links between the personal experience and the broader sociological concerns of social history. And, um, you know, as I've shown with that photograph that I showed, people's memories aren't always reliable. So it's good to connect them then into other things that are maybe a bit more tangible. Maybe it's the contextualization of personal memories. Yeah. Um, I know that you've both spoken a little bit about kind of the research. I know that you mentioned putting call, call outs on Facebook and things like that. And I guess that there's something it'd be really interesting to kind of understand a bit more about the research process that you went through, because obviously, you know, is this the kind of thing that there are archives that already exist for that maybe could be recommended to audience members who might want to go and look into it? Or is it really all kind of first new research that has to be done to pull all this together? Um, 
things, magazines are a good place to start. So in Scotland, things like M8 magazine, the List magazine is archived online. So that gives you practical information about where clubs were, what nights they had on, what took place at them. Um, Kirsty, have you got any other? No, I was kind of trying to think in terms of, I guess, sort of digitized like museum collections and sort of what I touched upon um, in the talk, yeah, kind of shows that, yeah, there isn't huge amounts. Um, one of the museum collections that a lot of the, ob well, say a lot, I think like six or seven of the objects in the main exhibition came from um, was actually VA South Kensington. Um, so they collected, for example, I think a lot of the things that they collected that came out of their club to culture, um, is it club to culture? The um, exhibition that they did in the early nineties, they looked at sort of night nightclub culture, looked at street, sorry, street style um, exhibition, sorry, in, in the early nineties. And there was some um, objects from that that ended up in the exhibition. So in terms of what's in a museum collection, and then they did a exhibition in I think in like 2017, that was called um, Club to Catwalk that really did look at I think some of the things that we explored um, in our section. Um, so yeah, I guess I, I look on the v &A website that, but I think that's more kind of fashion. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, I think there was something really interesting in what you were saying, Mary, around the fact that you didn't actually get many photographs because people yeah. just weren't taking pictures at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, you've, you've already spoken quite well about piecing together the history from various pieces of ephemera and kind of looking for the context of those personal memories is quite interesting. Um, thinking about clothing that you've just mentioned, Kirsty, we've got another question that's, what do you think the state of self-personalization and dress nowadays in nightclub, in nightlife club it, and clubbing? I'm gonna start that question again. <laughs> what do you think of the state of self-personalization and dress nowadays in nightlife or clubbing? Are we too far into the postmodern or past referential era for good for our own good I think or do you think there will be soon a big reset wow it's quite a mouthful <laughs> we'll go that much anymore so it's hard for me to say but my observations from afar <laughs> me that there are always subcultures they just don't take on the form that they used to take you know they're mediated through the internet or they're not documented at all in the public sphere. But yeah, I work at Glasgow School of Art, so I see it in the students. Yes, there are loads and loads of forms of innovation going on. Um, and, you know, when I was going out in the 90s, 60s clothes were what was available in secondhand boutiques. So there was a real 60s strand running through the 90s fashion in clubs in Glasgow at that time. So there is always that sort of reference to the past yeah. but an inventiveness. But like I say, I don't wear that much anymore. So I think that that really kind of resonates with um, something that Kat Rossi said in the talk that she did for us recently, which was as soon as you become a like you, when you're in this position and you're curating an exhibition about something, you kind of no longer in it when we're talking about things like nightclubs, because you're, you're reflecting on an experience of it rather than living it currently. Yeah. So as soon as we start archiving it, we're kind of we're archiving the past of it rather than the present of it. Mm which is quite interesting. Um, Facebook groups, Instagram groups, um, Tumblr, not so much anymore, but that's where you would go if you want to share and meet like-minded people, I think, and find out what's going on at the moment. Yeah. Um, I think well, probably one last question, which is, um, do you anticipate that nightclubs will have a renaissance and will people get ceremonially dressed up again post COVID? Yeah. I'm getting dressed up to go to the supermarket, so I will, <laughs> yeah, everyone will go bananas. So that's my prediction, my professional prediction. I think you can even see that with like the yeah, the reaction. Yeah, we touched upon it in in the main talk, but yeah, the reaction to nightclubs reopening in Scotland on Monday night, the fact that yeah, you know, there was like queues of people waiting for them to go in at midnight. Um, yeah, I think so too. I think, yeah, it'll be no time at all before, yeah, normal life resumes and yeah, people are together and celebrating again. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that is pretty much time. Um, so I just wanted to thank you both for such a kind of interesting and wonderful talk. Also, thank you really sincerely for curating Gallery 2 because it really is an amazing space. And if you have the opportunity to come and visit, please do come and see it.
Um, I also wanted to thank all of the wonderful audience members we've got tuning in today. We've got people from all over the world. We've got someone from Istanbul, someone from Leeds, someone from Fife. Um, it's really kind of a broad, wonderful audience. So Kirsty and Mary, if you just want to pop your video off, I'll just wrap up um, and close the event. <laughs>